الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعة من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعص الله ورسوله فلا يضر إلا نفسه ولا يضر الله شيئا We are still at the chapter 3 the core chapter of the book the chapter that has the three fundamental principles the three questions that one will be asked about in the grave and it's the heart of the book, like we said. We left off last week at the phrase, فَإِذَا قِيلَ لَكَ مَا الْأُصُولُ الثَّلَاثَةُ الَّتِي يَجِبُ عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ مَعْرِفَتُهَا فَقُلْ مَعْرِفَةُ الْعَبْدِ رَبَّهُ وَدِينَهُ وَنَبِيَّهُ مُحَمَّدًا صلى الله عليه وسلم فَإِذَا قِيلَ لَكَ مَا الرَّبُّكَ فَقُلْ رَبِّيَ اللَّهِ الَّذِي رَبَّانِي وَرَبَّى جَمِيعَ الْعَالَمِينَ بِنِعَمِهِ وَهُوَ مَعْبُودِي لَيْسَ لِي مَعْبُودٌ سِوَاهُ وَالدَّلِيلُ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ فَإِذَا قِيلَ لَكَ مَا الْأُصُولُ الثَّلَاثَةُ الثَّلَاثَةُ Pay attention to the tashkil Some of you made a lot of you made a mistake with الثَّلَاثَةُ ما الأصول الثلاثة التي يجب على الإنسان معرفتها If it said to you what are the three principles which a person must know فقل معرفة العبد ربه ودينه ونبيه محمدا فقل معرفة العبد ربه Then answer the, the, Then say it's the, the servant's knowledge of his Lord Say the servant's knowledge of his Lord Now here he used two different teaching tactics one which we mentioned last, uh, last week or two weeks ago in our last class. We mentioned that presenting the heart of this book, the fundamental three principles in a question format, I said it was a teaching tactic to change the method and style drawing interest to what he's about to talk about. But more so, I believe it's because one will be asked about these and questioned about them in his grave. So it was suitable that he present them in a Q&A form, format. The second style, in where, where we begin today, of writing, of his writing, is that he gave the answers in general. Your Lord, your religion, and your messenger, briefly, in short. Then in the next paragraph, he repeated each one of these three principles in detail. Now that's a style known to writers in English and in Arabic. It's a style to draw interest. Give a summary, be brief, then go in the detail. Even in English. If you look to the diagram structure of a well-written essay, you find that they start general. And then in the following uh, paragraphs, they get specific. You start with an attention getter and orient the reader with a summary, then go to detail. And that's what the author here did 
when he was talking about al usul al thalatha then he said so if it's said to you so if it is said to you fa idha qila laka if it's said to you who's the one asking here who's the one saying this to us he left that out the fa'il the doer the questioner he left it out why for two reasons number 1 because what's important is the answer that's what really matters here the answer is what matters number 2 there are matters that may depend on the one asking but here in this in this matter the answer does not depend on who's asking it can be anyone the answer doesn't depend on who is asking so leaving it out is very appropriate it could be your parents asking could be an angel could be a messenger of Allah anyone who's asking it doesn't really matter the answer in this matter will, all, will always be the same answer. So it doesn't mass, matter who's asking the question. الثلاثة. So he said, الثلاثة. The three principles. Al in الثلاثة, meaning the three known principles. Al, the, in this one, meaning it refers to something known from the situational context of the speaker and listener. The masjid. If I leave it just like that, it means the masjid we always attend. Because you already know it from me, the conversation between me and you. Or if I say Al-Kitab, you automatically know it's the Quran. If I just leave it like that. Or a certain book that's in your hand. al The three means the three. The three fundamental principles. We know from the situational context between the author and us, it's the three fundamental principles. The popular, well-known principles. These are the three principles that are the foundation of the deen. Now, you have to understand that these are not the only principles of the deen. Because Islam has more principles than these three. For example, in the future, we're going to talk about belief in angels. Belief in messengers. Those are principles. But they're not included with these three over here. So there's other principles outside these three principles. These here, these principles here, here are just like the other principles. But the difference is these principles are like the mother principles. Whereas other principles branch off from these in one way or another. Take the first question, for example. Knowing Allah, in Tawheed, in Allah. That's the head. That's the head of all other principles and matters. That's the head of the principles. So, for example, we have the principle of believing in angels, like I said. Believe in angels and messengers. Those are principles. But those principles become useless without that mother principle of belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are not the only three principles, but they are like the mother principles where other principles follow along behind them. Next word is, we took it briefly, I think two weeks ago, asl. And uh, uh, usul, the, the plur, is the plur, the asl, the plural of it is al-usul. We mentioned last week or two weeks ago that the, it's the foundation uh, which other matters are based on. Like the foundation of a wall. Alati yajibu, which a person must know. Alati yajibu means which a person must know. Yajibu, a must. Yajibu. This is the ruling on these three matters. It's a must. Yajibu means wajib. You must know it. This is not any ordinary wajib, but it's among the top of the wajib. The top. Al al insani. Al al insani, a must, a person must know. A person. Al insan is a person. An insan is a human, like we said. It's a human, and it's, it refers to Muslim and kafir and jinn. This call to the three principles refers to Muslim, kafir, and even jinn. The call to the principles of Islam, the call to tawheed, is a call to Muslim and kafir and jinn by ijma'. Like we said last 
last halaqa, we mentioned what insan was. Ma'rifatuha, that you must know. Ma'rifah here is defined like knowledge. Ma'rifah is to know, knowledge. Okay, now pay attention with me here. The author said we must know these matters, but he didn't tell us how we know. How we know? What's the method of attaining this ma'rifah? What's the method of attaining this knowledge? Maybe it's to keep the book short or for other obvious reasons. He didn't mention it, but it could be by asking, reading, listening, sitting with others, some matters by fitrah, and uh, some by intellect. So he didn't mention how uh, we uh, get to know these matters. The author said to know the three matters. Is knowing them sufficient? Just merely knowing them? Ma'rifah has two conditions. Number one is to know. And number two included and essential in ma'rifah is belief. You can't say, Wallahi, Imam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab said in his book to know these matters, I know them, that's it. That will take you to the irja. No, he said you got to know them, but it includes in them to believe in them and act according to them. If there is no fruit to ma'rifah, which is acting, the fruit is acting and believing in it, there's no ma'rifah. If the knowledge does not prove, if, if the knowledge does not produce the fruit of acting, then it's useless. One must act on their belief, submit, and accept to the laws and rules and regulations. Fir'aun, he knew his Lord. So did the shaitan. But it didn't do them any good. It was useless. Ma'rifah here is equal to ilm, to knowledge. It's knowledge. It's, uh, a, it's to place it in your heart, but the fruits must show on the body parts in the form of action. That show of ma'rifah and the action uh, is, you know, like uh, following the ordain, being submissive to the sharia of Allah and following the commands of Allah. If knowing the question was merely sufficient to pass in the test in the grave, then the shaitan would get an A plus on it. Because in the Quran, what did he say? Several times, Rabbi, anzirni. So when if, if it was only just knowing that, the shaitan knows it. There's knowing, there's believing, and there's acting on them, and you need all three of this. And we mentioned, and we went, see, you have to take this part of the book with chapter one. You mentioned that in chapter one. When we went through the four, that's why it's important, those introductory principles, the four introductory principles that we talked early on. Part of, it, part of it, if you remember, you believe in this, you know, you believe, you act. If one wants to answer the question in the first hurdle of the life after, in the grave, he needs to act on it and believe in it. Uh, the level of what one achieves of Tawheed will be the level of success in this dunya in and the akhirah. Look at the gauge and the measure for success in the Quran. Those who believe but don't take taint their iman with dhulm. Dhulm, of course, here is shirk. Complete iman. You do complete iman, you get complete amin, which is security in both worlds. And on top of that, huda, which is guidance. For who? For whoever brings this tawheed complete without any deficiencies in it. Therefore, the more deficiency in tawheed means the less doge, dosage of amin and huda which is security and guidance. Note here he used the word ma'rifa. We define ma'rifa as ilm, knowledge. In Arabic it's very similar to knowledge. Ma'rifa and ilm are very, very similar. However, there's detailed linguistic differences that you should keep in mind. Number one, with us, the creation, you can describe me and you as ma'rifa. If we knew something, we can describe it as ma'rifah like here. Just like we mentioned in this, the, the author mentioned here. To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't use ma'rifah. In describing and giving the quality of Allah, you don't use the word, word ma'rifah. Why? Because ma'rifah means 
You knew something and it was preceded with ignorance. It was preceded with ignorance. One was ignorant of something, then he had ma'rifah. You can't use that with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the term ilm is used instead as a quality of Allah. How? Ilm, sometimes the term refers to one who was ignorant at a time before. Like today, whoever didn't know matters we're talking about, they have ilm now. But they were for, before ignorant. When we speak about Allah's ilm as it pertains to Allah, it was not preceded with ignorance. To us, yes, it can happen that it's preceded with ignorance. With Allah, no. Ma'rifah, you can't use it with Allah because the definition of ma'rifah refers to that which is preceded with ignorance. Therefore, you can't say Allah has ma'rifah. Allah has ilm. Ilmullah. Ilmullah. Why? Because it was not preceded with ignorance. Ilm, can, you can apply both. But to Allah, to Allah, when we're talking about Allah, it was not preceded with ignorance. Okay, okay. listen. Ma'rifah and ilm both mean, let me repeat it. Ma'rifah and ilm mean knowledge. To us humans, uh, they can use, be used interchangeably. For me and you. You can say, Ahmad has ilm. That's good. You can say, Ahmad has ma'rifah. That's good. And I can say the same about you. Ma'rifah, the word, is knowing after you didn't know. That's us humans. You can't say Allah has ma'rifah because Allah's ilm is eternal. It was not preceded with ignorance, ma'ad Allah. With Allah we say ilm, ilmullah, not ma'rifatullah. We use the word ilm. And why? Let me give it to you in an A and B. A, it may mean like ma'rifah. Ilm may mean like ma'rifah, which is preceded with ignorance. So that may apply to me and you. But ilm also, unlike ma'rifah, has also another definition where it doesn't necessarily always mean that it was preceded with ignorance. That's why we can use that term when we're speaking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When ilm pertains to us humans, it could mean ma'rifah. Knowledge after ignorance. When ilm pertains to Allah, it's the B definition, which is the knowledge that's not preceded with ignorance. That can be a definition of ilm, but it can't, it's not a definition of ma'rifah, since ma'rifah is strictly preceded with ignorance. Okay, if you got that. Another nice delicate meaning in this word ma'rifah is ma'rifah is uh, mostly used in the context that uh, someone's being vilified in the Quran. It's some kind of context where it's, it's talking about someone who's vilified. It comes in the Quran, for example, followed by uh, talking about those who are denying the truth. The people who gave the book to يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمَ الَّذِينَ خَسِرُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ يَعْرِفُونَهُ That was in Surah Al-An'am. In Surah Al-Nahl, Allah said, يَعْرِفُونَ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ يُنْكِرُونَهَا Talking about vilified people. He used ma'rifah, that they knew. In those and similar verses, he said they knew the truth and rejected it. Using the word ma'rifah. Instead of ilm. Whereas ilm could have been applied there as well. So a nice delicate linguistic difference between ilm and ma'rifah is that ma'rifah is usually in the context of vilification in the Quran. Usually. Usually in the Quran and the hadith it's like that. But not always. Whereas on the other hand, ilm usually comes in praise. There's a hadith that's sahih in sahih Muslim ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu narrated in one of the narrations of it. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qala li mu'adh lamma arsalahu lil yaman فَلْيَكُنْ أَوَّلَ مَا تَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَيْهِ أَنْ يَعْرِفُ اللَّهِ The hadith when Mu'adh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Mu'adh to, to Yaman, he said, أَنْ يَعْرِفُ اللَّهِ أَنْ يَعْرِفُ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهُمْ عَرَفُوا اللَّهِ فَأَخْبِرْهُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ فَرَضَ عَلَيْهِمْ خَمْسَ صَلَوَاتِ We mentioned this hadith before, but in one of its narrations, the Prophet ﷺ told Mu'adh when he was telling him what to talk to the people in Yemen, he said, teach them 
If they have ma'rifatullah, they have the knowledge in Allah, he is ma'rif instead of ilm. If they have ma'rif of Allah, then let them know that there's five obligatory prayers, the pillars of Islam. We just mentioned that ma'rifah is in the context of vilify. Our point here is that the Prophet ﷺ used ma'rifah in a praiseworthy context. Why? We just said ma'rifah is usually, usually in the context of vilification. Usually, but not necessarily always. It could come in a praiseworthy context like in this hadith. And this is one of the exceptions. Uh, this hadith when the Prophet ﷺ said mu'ad. And this is why the author used it in this uh, sentence instead of ilm. Meaning, there's no reason to object at him for using ma'rifah. He's not wrong for using ma'rifah instead of ilm. Because some, sometimes, sometimes it's used in a praiseworthy context. Knowledge, ilm, is the opposite. It's usually in the praiseworthy context. Possibly, rarely, in a uh, negative context. Now moving on. We finished ma'rifatuha. The three matters that one uh, per, per, a person should know. He said, when you ask this, faqul. Say. Say and say firmly. Give your answer firmly. Firm in your belief. You must be firm. There's no room for doubt in this matter. Allah said in the Quran, thumma lam yartabu. You have no doubts. فَقُلْ مَعْرِفَةُ الْعَبْدِ رَبَّهُ Then say, the servant's knowledge of his Lord. The servant's knowledge of his Lord. فَقُلْ Be firm in both your answer and your belief. مَعْرِفَةُ الْعَبْدِ The servant's knowledge. The servant's knowledge of what? Which servant first? Which servant? There's two types of servants. One that's by force. And then the servant by choice. In Surah Maryam, in Kullu man fis samawati wal ardi illa at rahmani abda. There's none in the heavens, in the earth, but they will come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as slaves by force. Then there's the servant who's by choice, who does that which Allah told him to do. Ubudiyat al ta'a wal imtithal. And that's like in Surah Al-Furqan, وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَنِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا The characteristics in Surah Al-Furqan. The faithful slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who walk on this earth in humility. And that's for the believers by choice because they chose to do that. Those who answer the questions and live by them are of course the second category. The worshippers by choice who we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we be among them. Rabbahu, ma'rifatul abdi, Rabbahu. You must know your Lord. Know the word Lord from Lordship. Ma'rifatul abdi, Rabbahu. So now we know Rabb is Lord. And it refers to what? Tawheed, Rububiyya, Lordship. That Allah is the creator, sustainer, maintainer, and so on. We already went through the Tawheed of Lordship. Ma'rifatul abdi, Rabba. Now, that refers to lordship. But when you're asked in the grave, who's your lord? Marabbuk. Is it lordship only? Is the test in the grave only a test of lordship? Because the hadith says marabbuk. That's lordship right there. Rabb, rububiyya. Lordship. The question appears to only state that it will be asking about lordship. But what about uluhiyya? What about the worship? What about the oneness of Allah when we give our worship to Allah? What about that? If we're only going to be tested on Lordship, and that's all we're going to be asked about on Lordship, Rububiyyah, then Quraysh who opposed the Prophet ﷺ would all pass the test. Since the Quran clearly states that Qurayshians believe in Lordship. And in fact, Allah in many verses used their belief in Lordship to convince them to believe in the worship, in the uluhiyya aspect. Not only will Quraysh pass that test in their grave, but the devil will pass it. Rabbi, anzirni. Rabbi, he used to say, Rabbi, the, the devil. The new students of you here who, who, who don't know the difference between the two, you have to go back to the previous classes uh, because this connects back and we don't have time to go over that. 
I don't remember which class it was, but we spoke on the three branches of Tawheed. In the grave, you're going to be asked, Mar -rabbuk. That comes from Rububiyyah. Who's your Lord? If it's literally Rabb of Rububiyyah, then ne nearly everyone will pass. Because even the Kuffar of Quraysh didn't have a problem with it. And that's why Allah says, وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ most of them believe not in Allah except while they attribute partners onto Him. They believe in Tawheed al-Rububiyyah. But the Hadith says, we will be asked about Rabb, which is a rububiyyah Does that mean Abu Jahl will pass the first hurdle in his grave? Let me answer that. This rububiyyah in here, in this hadith, مَنْ is rububiyyah, But it also includes uluhiyyah in it. Remember before in that class I was telling you about, we said, and if you don't pay attention to those statements we'll be talking about in Tawheed, it's a problem. I said rububiyyah requires uluhiyyah. Uluhiyyah includes rububiyyah. And rububiyyah requires uluhiyyah. Rububiyyah here, Requires uluhiyya. How? Look at what Allah says in the Quran. وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ If you ask them, who is the creator of the sky and the earth? They will say Allah. So they believe in Tawheed al rububiyya They believe in Tawheed al rububiyya So Allah said after that, قُلْ أَفَرَأَيْتُمْ مَا تَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ إِنْ أَرَادَنِيَ اللَّهُ بِضُرْ هل هن كاشفات ضره أو أرادني برحمة هل هن ممسكات رحمته قل حسبي الله عليه يتوكل المتوكل متوكلون الله is telling them as in many other verses if you believe in the first part which is lordship you believe he's the creator he's the sustainer based on that you're required and you must Believe in the second one, which is uluhiyya, which is to direct your worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me explain it in a scenario, which will explain this verse that I just mentioned and actually similar verses like it throughout the Quran where Allah spoke about rububiyya and said, if you believe in this, then you're required to believe in uluhiyya. You, Samir, you gave me a hundred dollars. You provided me with $100. You're the provider of that $100. I agree that you're the provider of that $100. But then I turn to Ra'id. And I say, thank you, Ra'id. I owe you a lot of favors, Ra'id. You, you know, I'm very grateful to you. Allah has the supreme example. He gives, He provides, He sustains, He maintains, then one directs his worship or a portion to it to other than Allah. That's how rububiyya requires uluhiyya. But one who perfects his uluhiyya, that means his rububiyya is included in it. How? If I say to Samir, Samir, thank you. You gave me $100. I really appreciate it. You have done me a lot of favors. That includes within it, when I thank him, that I believe Samir, uh, Samir is the giver of that $100. I agree to that. When one directs his worship to Allah, it means his rububiyya is included. It means he agrees to the lordship of Allah. Overall, overall. Someone who worships one Allah, devotes his ibadah to his Lord, has affirmed that the creator, the sustainer, is one. Now going back to our issue at hand. In the grave, the question is, Man Rabbuk, who's your Lord? That's the first question of the hurdles that you're going to have to go through. The first principle of the three fundamental principles. It must include uluhiyya. It must include uluhiyya. Even though the word is Rabb from rububiyya, it includes uluhiyya in it. Why? And how? First of all, number one, sometimes uluhiyya is included 
in matters like this by the purpose and intent. We know overall by the purpose and intent. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, was sent to teach Tawheed and the struggle with Quraysh was in Uluhiyyah. Do you think that we, we will be asked about Rububiyyah and not about Uluhiyyah and then that's it, we'll pass the test? Some ulama said that when Rububiyyah is mentioned, Uluhiyyah is included by purpose and intent. Because the rule as we took it is Rububiyyah requires Uluhiyyah. The entire scenario I mentioned, Rububiyyah requires belief in Uluhiyyah. So therefore, it is included when one is going to be asked about Man Rabbuk. We will be asked in the grave, Man Rabbuk, Lordship, but Uluhiyyah is included in there. Mustalzama laha. It's included in it. Allah didn't send the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa with Uluhiyyah in vain like that. The second thing, others said the same thing, but in a different way. That's the, the second opinion is Uluhiyyah is included in Rububiyyah when one is in, questioned in the grave. But they came at it from a different angle. They said the terms Rububiyyah and Uluhiyyah are like the terms of Iman and Islam. How is Rububiyyah and Uluhiyyah resembling Iman and Islam? With Iman and Islam, whenever they're together, in a sentence, in a hadith, in an ayah, in one sentence, or a statement, each has its independent meaning. But if they're separated, meaning Iman is alone in an ayah, or in a hadith, or Islam is alone in, by itself in an ayah or a hadith, then Iman would include what Islam, what falls under Islam. And Islam, would include what falls under Iman, when they're separate. We'll talk about that in the future, inshallah, when we get to the pillars of faith. But that's the rule on Iman and Ihsan. So the ulama said, the same applies to Rububiyyah and Uluhiyyah. If you say Iman and Islam together in a sentence, or see it in the Quran, or in a hadith, in one sentence, whatever the context may be, then each one has a different detailed meaning. Iman, ha Iman has its detailed meanings and Islam has its detailed meanings. If they are separate, alone, meaning I mention Iman alone by itself, or you find it in a Quran or in the Hadith, if it's detached from Islam, then when they're separate, Iman includes the meaning of Islam. And when Islam is separate in a hadith or ayah, it includes the meanings of Iman. They said the same applies to Tawheed al rububiyyah and Tawheed al uluhiyyah If they're mentioned together, they have their own detailed meaning. Tawheed al rububiyyah we know what it is. We know Tawheed al uluhiyyah what it is. And when a rububiyyah lordship, is mentioned alone, like the hadith that we have here, who is your Lord in the grave? They said in such a hadith, it includes uluhiyyah, the meanings of uluhiyyah in it. And if uluhiyyah is mentioned alone, then it includes rububiyyah in it. For example, in الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا In Surah Fussilat. The verse says, those who say Allah is our Lord and follow along with it. رَبُّنَا رَبُّنَا Which means, Rabb, Lordship. That verse, there's nothing in worship about it. It doesn't mention uluhiyyah in it. They said in a verse like that, Rabbuna, in alladhina qalu Rabbuna, it also includes uluhiyyah in that word. Or in another verse, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Know that there is none but He. This is Allah. إِلَّا إِلَّا إِلَّهِ إِلَّهُ This is uluhiyyah. No one's worthy of being worshipped but Allah. Worship here is mentioned alone. Uluhiyyah is mentioned alone. But the rule says, Rububiyyah is included in such a verse. Like Islam and Iman, like Rububiyyah and Uluhiyyah, like Faqir and Miskin, all of them have the same rule. Why we mention this? Going back to show that when you're asked in the grave, who's your Lord? This is Lordship alone. The Hadith is Lordship alone. But it includes worship within it. This is 
not just lordship that you're going to be asked, you, it includes within it uluhiyya. So the ulama have two avenues on how uluhiyya is included. Both really lead to the same point that they don't question the matter that uluhiyya is included in such a uh, hadith like we have over here, marrabbuk. That rule on uluhiyya and rububiyya applies not only here, but all ha other hadith and verses that include rububiyya and uluhiyya in them, either together or alone. Uh, if it was a test on man rabbuk, like we said, and you just say it's man rabbuk and that's all, the mushrikeen and the muwahideen and the shaitan and everybody would be equivalent because many affirm tawheed al rububiyya now we go to the second principle. The second principle, he said, وَدِينِهِ The second principle is, you'll be asked about your religion, your deen. Uh, deen, in a way, can be defined, in a sense, as uh, worship or obedience. It can be defined as worship and obedience. Why? Because your deen means to do uh, what one is obligated to do and to leave that which one is uh, supposed to be refraining from and that in itself is obedience it's worship and uh, that uh, when you're obedient to Allah that's worship so that could be a definition of deen uh, no we're going through the three principles and still in the summary stage this is just the summary stage uh, the author in the following paragraph will elaborate on each one of them then after Deen, he mentioned وَنَبِيَّهُ مُحَمَّدًا صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وسلم. The third principle is the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. Why? Why would the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم be the third principle? Uh, because it's a question in the grave. When it's a question in the grave, you better believe it's going to be a principle. And he is the mediator صلى الله عليه وسلم, between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in learning this Deen. Just as all messengers are. They're the ones who brought these teachings to us. Allah created people to worship Him. And it's unseen. The way we worship Him is ghaib. So it's essential that He send messengers to teach us the religion and convey it to us. Therefore, by proof of text and intellect, sending messengers is essential to this universe so they can teach us that guidance. We believe in ghaib. We would have never knew the knowledge of ghaib or the knowledge of this deen without the messengers and more particular for us, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The messenger is important, therefore, therefore it is a fundamental principle that one will be asked about in his grave. The, the message he brought us is important. So it's a principle, deen. The book, that's another principle and... Uh, uh, part of the deen. And of course, the one who was sent with it, the Prophet ﷺ, that's a principle. And the one who sent him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's a principle. So they all relate to each other in a way. The importance of knowing the Prophet ﷺ in his life comes from the importance of uh, the one who sent him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who we worship. And we worship alone. And it also comes from the importance of the message that he was sent with. He was sent by Allah with the Sharia. And that is, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu is the third principle. He concludes now his introductory brief statement on the three fundamental principles right here. And now he's going to repeat the three principles and elaborate a little bit more on each one of them. And that's what I mentioned in the start of the halaqa today when I said, uh, if you remember, uh, I said he's going to talk about them briefly to make sure you have a super basic outline of what it is, then he's going to go in depth. So now he's going to start going in depth. He goes on to say, فَإِذَا قِيلَ لَكَ مَنْ رَبُّكَ So if it's said to you, who is your Lord? Then say, my Lord is Allah. فَإِذَا فَإِذَا If it's said to you. إِذَا If. The fa here in, if, in فَإِذَا is fa al fasiha The fa by itself. الْإِفْصَاحِ بِمَعْنَ الْبَيَانِ Meaning the fa explains. It's going to explain an answer to a question. 
It's going to explain an answer to a question. This type of fat means an explanation is going to follow. Here, what's the explanation? The answer to if you are asked, uh, who is your Lord? Now he's going to explain to it. If it's said to you, we said he did not say who, because the answer is what matters. And it doesn't matter who is asking. The answer remains the same regardless. So if it's said to you, who is your Lord? Then say, my Lord is Allah. We established that worship is included in lordship in the statement. Who is your Lord means who is your Lord who created you and gave you life and prepared you and gave you your provision and continues to provide you with all your needs. Simple question. And a lot of people say, well, oh, we know it. Let's move on. It is simple. The fact that you know it's simple and you believe in it is something worthy of saying, Alhamdulillah, day and night. That Allah guided you to this simple question that you say, yeah, it's true. I'm, I'm, I agree with you. Marabbuk, simple question. You and me, that's the fadl of Allah upon us that we believe it's a simple question and we know it. And we ask Allah to keep us steadfast on it. But the obvious belief in this question, masses, millions, don't know it or don't believe in it. And Allah said it. وَمَا آمَنَ مَعَهُ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ Only if you believed in it. Millions don't believe in it. وَإِن تُطِعْ أَكْثَرَ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ يُضِلُّوكَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ The majority will lead you astray. وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ A majority will not believe except with shirk. وَقَلِيلٌ مِنْ عِبَادِ الشَّكُورِ A few are the ones who are thankful. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَقَلِيلٌ مَهُمْ They're few. So yes, it's a simple question, alhamdulillah, that we believe in it. Verses, these are verses stating that the majority don't believe or don't accept or reject this. So this simple question, when we pass by it and you say this is very obvious, don't ever disdain it. Instead, say alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, that we believe in it and may Allah continue to keep us steadfast on it. Man rabbuk. He said, the question is, man rabbuk? Let's look at ar rabb ar rabb if you take out the part of it, the part of it, al, that means a the, then it's the owner of something, who controls something, or who rules something, who has position of something under his control. Like the famous hadith, when they came to destroy the Kaaba, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the year the Prophet sallallahu was born in, his grandfather went, and he said to them, "Ana Rabbul Ibil, walil bayt Rabbun Yahmi." He said, "I'm the Lord of the camels. Give me my camels back. That Kaaba has a Lord that's going to protect it." A Rabb Lord is literally defined as that it comes from the word terbiya to nurture. Allah nurtured us and all of His creation with His favors and His blessings. So it sort of stems from the word terbiya, nurtured us. Its root word is al-murabbi. Nearly all linguistic definitions uh, refer to that word. Raising up, bringing up, or more accurately, the more accurate word possibly in English is nurture. Rabb includes maintaining us, protecting us, the master, the sustainer, the given, the one who gives us terbiya, nurture. It means he raised us step by step. Allah raised us every single step of the way. From the, earth, from the beginning to the end. The best, most honorable way He raised us is by sending us the messengers to warn us and to promise us. قُلْ بِفَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَبِرَحْمَتِهِ فَبِذَلِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُ وَخَيْرٌ مِمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ That's the best, the best, one of the best provisions that Allah gave us. The best, purest, mightiest blessing of all blessings, is that He nurtured us with Tawheed. That's part of the tarbiya. If you lost everything on this earth, but have man rabbuk, right? You have everything. 
If you have man rabbuka wrong, but you have everything on this earth, you have nothing. You're a loser without it. If you're living on crumbs of bread in a small cup of water, but you have man rabbuk, you got it all. Whoever follows my guidance, he shall neither go astray, nor sure shall he be distressed. If you're in the most luxury, the best high-rise mansions, and you're hopping in the best restaurants, but you don't have tawheed, that are all, that's all going to turn into misery. وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ Whoever turns away from my dhikr, from my tawheed, verily for him is a life of hardship. And we shall raise him on the judgment day, a'ma, blind. Going back to al-rabb, man rabbuk. Al-rabb uh, also means that he blessed us with our physical bodies and our qualities, our desires, our thinking, our mind, and more and more. You know, we can go on for weeks talking about that which Allah provided. Not weeks, a life, a lifelong of lectures talking about what Allah provided us. Uh, it, it doesn't just mean individually also. That's a small part of it. But it's universal. The alam, he nurtured the alam. The universe is nurtured by Allah. Tarbiyah, the definition of Rabb is, is, is to nurture. And that he made, part of that is also that he made choices for the universe. He's the one who makes the choices. Our Murabbi, our nurture, means linguistically, our Lord, our Rabb, subhanahu wa ta'ala, means the same thing as the sustainer, provider, our Malik, al Sayyid, al Mudabbir, al Mun'im. Allah nurtures all of the creation with his favors and blessings. And he has prepared for them. Allah in this life and in the life after. He supported them with all their needs. The blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are so many that they can't be counted. And Allah told us that. If you were to try to count the blessings of Allah, you wouldn't be able to. وَإِن تَعُدُّ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا وَإِن تَعُدُّ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا It's impossible for us to even count it. There's no time to even give a glimpse of the detailed blessings that Allah provided us. Uh, so, you know, just knowing that He's the provider, sustainer, He gives us, He nurtures us from the beginning to the end, you know, you got to keep that in mind. Um, I remember a, a story by Ibn Simak, a pious scholar, Abid. He went with a leader of his time to the outskirts, to a desert for something. The leader got very thirsty and he asked him, he asked Ibn Samak for a cup of water. Very, very thirsty. So Ibn Samak took the opportunity to advise him as he was giving him water, a nice cold drink of water. He said, oh leader, rich, wealthy, has control. This cold water, if you couldn't get it but to pay money, how much would you pay? The leader said, I'd give half my kingdom for it. He said, what if Allah, Ibn Samak said, what if Allah blocked that cup of water, that water in you, you couldn't get it out, you meaning you couldn't urinate it. How much would you pay to urinate it? The leader said, I'd pay the other half of my kingdom. Ibn Samak began to cry and he said, what a kingdom. That's not equivalent to a single cup of water. What a kingdom, that's not equivalent to a cup of water. Go to those suffering from a kidney stone or other ailments or problems in the midst of their suffering. Telling them, tell them you won't be cured unless you give everything you own. All the money you have. All the houses you have. Not a single one of them would hesitate. They'd give it to you. That's from our Rabb. That's a Rabb. That's from the meaning of a Rabb. Who gives us all that? The entire universe is drowned in the blessings of Allah from the top of their heads to the bottom of their feet. When we say alam, the entire alam universe, when we say alam with a fatha, alam, 
ane, which is universe, we translate it in English into universe. It's everything other than Allah. The alam of the jinn, the alam of the ins, which is a human in the jinn, the alam of the devils, the alam of the oceans, the alam of the birds, the alam of the animals and others that we don't, we may know about and some that we don't, we don't know about. Alam, uniquely was a word called that because they're a sign. It comes from the word sign, like a flag. A sign of Allah's creation on this earth. Just like your laptops are a sign that someone manufactured them. We are a sign. We are like a flag, a sign of Allah, that we are Allah's creation. And proof that Allah is our Lord who exists. And that's a response to those who are atheists. Some define the Rabb as Al-Khaliq uh, Ibtida'an, Al-Murabbi Ghada'an, Al-Ghafirun Tiha'an. He created us from our start. He nurtures us with all our needs. And he forgives all our sins. The Shar'i meaning for us, Al-Rabb, when it's mentioned here alone, it includes the definition of both al rububiyyah and the definition of al uluhiyyah in it. Here it means Al-Rabb, Man Rabbuk, the creator, the provider, the nurturer, uh, which are of course lordship qualities. And we add on that the worship qualities and the definition of uh, ubudiyya or, or, or uh, uluhiyya. Because we said when they're separate and they are here, like we mentioned earlier, when in the summary sentence, Rabb carries the meaning of ilah, worship, because they're mentioned separately, like iman and islam. When accompanied with uh, each other, Rabb has its meaning, and uh, uluhiyya has its definition and meaning. The author later on mentioned the Arab is Al Khaliq Al Ma'bud. Al Khaliq Al Ma'bud. Al Khaliq means the creator, and the uh, Ma'bud is uh, Uluhiyya. In, in that, what, that's to show you that he includes both of them in that. Uh, some said Rububiyya, when they're separate, they include each other. And then when they're together, each has its own meaning. We mentioned that. I want to go back to that and, and, and talk a, lot, a little bit more about that. That's one opinion. Some even said there's an ijma' on that. that uh, they're like iman and ihsan. That's the first one. Another group, uh, which I told you about, uh, is, is, is that it's by intent and purpose. They included it by intent and purpose. They said here, lordship is by itself, only lordship. So the question to them, what are you, what are you saying? That uluhiyya is not included in passing the test? They said, no. Here, lordship is by itself. But we arrive at the same conclusion as the other people. But in a slightly different way. And both of them are correct. They just, uh, you know, it's, it's good for the student and knowledge to know this. Uh, they said rububiyya is meant here alone. But rububiyya is like a foundation. That foundation, or an essential part of that foundation, you can't have that rububiyya unless you have uluhiyya. They said that's the Quranic method of combining between the two. So when you're asked, who's your Lord? They said, it includes worship because by that. Worship is part of the foundation of rububiyya. How? Allah in the Quran said, Ya ayyuhan nasu abudu rabbakum, alladhi khalaqakum, walladhina min qablikum, la'allakum tattakun. Worship your Lord. In the beginning, it starts with, worship your Lord. Worship, u'budu. Worship, okay, no, this is going to start with uluhiyya and end with uluhiyya. Who do we worship, ya Allah? He says, worship. And then at the end, he said, don't make shirk in uluhiyya. Who do we worship? He mentions qualities, and all these qualities are qualities of lordship. Because if you leave, believe in lordship, he's trying to tell us, the foundation, then you should believe in the worship and make tawheed in it. 
فأخرج به من الثمرات رزقا لكم فلا تجعلوا لله اندادا وانتم تعلمون all those qualities all those qualities that he mentions in this verse are qualities of lordship so Allah established the uh, the lordship qualities he established rububiyya the foundation he said the verse says oh you worship Allah who created you and those before you so that you may be muttaqun uh, created but first he says worship worship is uluhiyya who do we worship number one who created you worship means uh, the one who created you uh, the one who created you and those before you la'allakum tattaqun alladhi ja'ala lakum al-arda firasha the one who made this earth a resting place created you made this earth a resting place was sama'a bina'a made the sky a canopy wa anzala min as-sama'i ma'a brought down the rain from the sky fa akhraja bihi min al-thamarati rizqan lakum he provided fruits all these what are the qualities there's the qualities of rububiyyah then at the end he says fala taj'alu lillahi andadan wa antum ta'lamun don't associate don't make rivals to allah in your worship fala taj'alu lillahi andadan and that, that means don't commit shirk and uluhiyya. All the qualities were rububiyya. Once he established that foundation because they believed in it, he said, فَلَا تَجْعَلُوا لِلَّهِ Don't commit shirk and uluhiyya. Uh, both approaches I mentioned in including uluhiyya and rububiyya are good. And both of them lead to the same thing. The second approach is that the rububiyya is a foundation. And an essential part of that foundation is uluhiyya. And they said that because of how the Quran is, like the, mention, the verse I mentioned. Uh, the first approach was that when rububiyya is not in a sentence with uluhiyya, they include the terms of and the meanings of each other, like iman and ihsan. Uh, two avenues lead to the identical same ending and both ways of thinking are right. Uh, I, I just give you that to show you, you know, to open the minds of a student of knowledge. Uh, I, I believe it may, may be that the author was leaning slightly towards the second approach, but Allahu A'lam, we can't tell for sure. After he established uh, the foundation of Rububiyyah, he mentioned worship. Because he said, huwa ma'budi. Huwa ma'budi. Uh, Allahu A'lam, it could be that he... Uh, was slightly lenient towards the second approach. Either avenue is good, but don't leave here saying rububiyya means uluhiyya and uluhiyya means rububiyya. You fall in the hands of the, the, in, the, in, the, in the belief of the mubtadi'ah. They're completely different. They're different types of tawheed. Claiming they are one is the talk of Ahlul Bidah. In fact, Sheikh Ali Al-Khudir has a response to that. He wrote a letter, responded to that. Uluhiyya has its definition and meaning. Rububiyya has its definition and its meaning. But we, what we mentioned of the two avenues is to show how they are inclusive in a hadith like this one over here which we have and in many verses and many hadith other than that. When, so th what we just mentioned is to show you how Uluhiyya is inclusive and man rabbuk. Now when one is being asked in the grave, who's your Lord? We know that uluhiyya is included in that as well. Then he said, Rabbani, Rabbani. The next word he said is Rabbani, means he created me, placed me in existence. He blessed me with external and internal provision. He made it more general and broader. After that as well, he said, Meaning, it's not only for me, that he nurtured me when he said the first statement, no one special. He brought the universe, the alam, from non existence and provided them with his provision. That's like, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Bini'amihi, bini'amihi. The ba in bini'amihi is ba sababiyya, meaning because of his blessings. What blessings? All the blessings that we mentioned earlier, eternal and external, zahira wal batina. Zahira are blessings that you can see and touch, and you can see or touch or know of. And then al batina are blessings that can't be seen. 
And these blessings start when one is in his mother's womb and even before that, in, con in, in his creation, his nourishment, the angels right and what's going to happen to him. And they continue on, and not until death, even way beyond that. And he wakes, when he wakes up, he sleeps. All that, and like we mentioned earlier, there's so many blessings from Allah. He said, when you're asked these questions, say, Rabbi Allah, my Lord, the one who nurtured me. But no, it's not even that. It's broader than that. Rabbi Allah, who Rabbani wa Rabba Jami al Alamina bi ni'ami. Meaning, you enter a universe with everything in it is from the provision of Allah. And it's not a specialty for you. It's universal. Al Alamin. Al Alamin, it's everyone other than Allah. After he made sure one must admit Allah is the creator, the Rabb. Then the author moves on to what is Tawheed al-Uluhiyya. This is why uh, I told you some may state or think that he might have been lenient to include in uh, al-Uluhiyya under al rububiyya in this hadith by using the second avenue. He established rububiyya. Now he goes on to Tawheed al-Uluhiyya to so that, that it's essential. Wahuwa ma'budi. وَهُوَ مَعْبُودِي What's مَعْبُودِي? وَهُوَ مَعْبُودِي means that he is the one I worship. This is a continuation. If he's the Lord who raised me and nurtured me and the universe, obviously I should worship him. وَاتَّخَذُوا مِن دُونِهِ آلِهَةً لَا يَخْلُقُونَ شَيْئًا وَهُمْ يُخْلَقُونَ وَلَا يَمْلِكُونَ لِأَنفُسِهِمْ ضَرًّا وَلَا نَفْعًا Allah mentioned in this verse, Seven categories or characteristics of people unworthy of being worshipped. They don't create nothing. They are created. They don't they can't control even if something bad happens to them. They don't have control over benefits to them. They have no control over death. وَلَا حَيَاتًا They don't have control over life. And the seventh one is وَلَا يَمْلِكُونَ مَوْتًا وَلَا حَيَاتًا وَلَا نُشُورًا And they don't have no control over the resurrection. Anyone who has those qualities, Allah is saying, they're unworthy of worship. Just like the many other verses which state أَيُشْرِكُونَ مَا لَا يَخْلُقُوا شَيْئًا وَهُمْ يُخْلَقُونَ They associate partners to Allah who don't create nothing and they themselves are created. He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who nurtured this universe, the author saying, the one who nurtured this universe is the one I succumb to, I subdue myself and show my humility, and I worship he and him alone. He mentioned ubudiyya, which is the second type of tawheed, because it's the fruit of rububiyya, and it's at the core of fulfilling the duties or the worship of rububiyya. Then he said, لَيْسَ لِي مَعْبُودٌ سِوَى لَيْسَ here is to deny. Nafi. Nafi. He denies worshipping anyone but Allah. Siwa means anyone other than Allah. He, he goes, Siwa is to affirm, to ithbat. Meaning, I only worship Allah, I deny everything other than Allah. He combined between the ithbat and nafi in that sentence. Remember we said, Tawheed is ithbat and nafi. Earlier, he said, هُوَ مَعْبُودِي He's the one I worship. That's sufficient right there. The only one I worship is Allah. But he wanted to reiterate it with ithbat and nafi. With ithbat means to affirm that Allah is the only one worship I worship. And nafi is to deny that I worship anyone other than Allah. لَيْسَ لِي مَعْبُودٌ سِوَى Is to affirm the previous statement. هُوَ مَعْبُودِي No one is worthy of my worship. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This refers to both major and minor shirk. No one is worthy of me worshiping but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No statue, no angels worthy of my worship. That we don't disagree on. But also, you got to keep in mind, no sheikh, no friend, no onlooker is worthy of me showing off and getting my ibadah canceled out or a portion of it. What dalilu qawlu ta'ala, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Okay, uh, we'll stop here, inshallah, at the dalil. The dalil is, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.
جزاكم الله خيرا صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم